The Lord be with you. Welcome to our Sunday morning message for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Hearing St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who am I? Common question we ask ourselves all the time. How to even start figuring that out? What do you do to begin to know or find yourself? What do I know? What am I good at? What can I see myself doing for the long haul? We know what we like, what we don't like. And this begins shaping our decision-making. We all begin our lives with an identity. We're born into families, living in communities, family histories. But if we have a faith connection, we have a far different yet larger and unimaginably unique family, the family of believers in Jesus. We are his brothers and sisters, children of the Heavenly Father. Christ himself is our identity newborn by water and the word in baptism, wrapped up with faith and the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes there feels like there's a disconnect with what goes on in here in the church and out there in the world. But if actions speak louder than words, and if we're honest with ourselves, most of our actions don't always show faith. We don't always confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Rather, our lives might testify that he isn't always around doing much of anything. The disasters, the economy, the COVID, terrorism, discrimination, endless lists of things that harm us. But now, remember, that doesn't prove that Jesus isn't around. It doesn't testify that he's absent. Instead, it shows he's still working, but in other ways, namely through his people. That's you and me, believers in Christ. And he's asking us what we believe, that our faith may show in our lips and in our lives. Jesus wants that for us, wants that for his disciples. This is why he drags them out along to Caesarea Philippi, as far away from the disciples' comfortable known culture as one could get, standing in front of an ancient sacred spring flowing from the mouth of a cave with a shrine to the god Pan. He's the Roman god, half man, half goat, guarding deserted places. At the entrance are very large gates. Strangely enough, Israel's King Herod and his son Herod Philip built such an obstetatious facade there, showcasing Rome's great wealth and power. Interesting place, I'm sure. Probably made us think of Halloween-ish, I guess. But Jesus wants his disciples experiencing this. Wants them to know what the mission field is like. Wants them to know that not everyone spent all day in the Templar synagogue talking about the finer points of Deuteronomy. There's a whole other world out there. Our, uh, <clears throat> Jesus talks about the other world, the public opinion of the day. Who do people say that I am? This question makes some sense when you realize that the rock face of the cave forms the backdrop and it has numerous niches and Grottoes that are still visible even today where miniature shrines to all the other gods would have been placed in Rome's pantheon, ensconced there to pray to. So who do people say that Jesus is? There could be lots of answers out there. Maybe he's an absent God. Maybe he's one of many, a nice guy. Maybe he's warm and friendly with a few superpowers up his sleeve. A superhero, somebody that can rescue us, help us, a safety net. Maybe a Beatles let it be kind of groupie. Maybe he's a rule enforcer. Well, the disciples said that some say you're John the Baptizer, which is interesting connection. He's Jesus' cousin, similar age, similar activities. We walked and talked around Israel. 
Or Elijah, he was a well-known prophet, healed many, said he'd return, ushering in the time of the Messiah. Or Jeremiah, he was another great prophet, taught and spoke against all the bad religious leaders. Jesus could be a new leader, a new king, a new power force, a new prophet, a new something. So Jesus asked this question in this place. And so his disciples can take stock of the reality that the kingdom of God coming in Jesus is not limited to geographic or ethnic boundaries. So guys, who do you say that I am? You are Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. Boom, great answer. Talk about though mixing politics and religion. The name Jesus had political connotations with Yeshua, Joshua, a warrior, a savior, a servant, all those things. And Christ, the Messiah, the new king, the holy anointed one. Talk about Davidic power and glory, ushering back a greater time for Israel. And then living God, an Old Testament deeply rooted belief of a religious provider, the great I am. Powerful confession from him. It encompasses who and what Jesus is. And Jesus praises Simon, son of Jonah, for this. But now, after speaking important words, Simon becomes Peter, Petrus, rock. And he's called rock. Not because he's so strong, because we always know he really isn't. But because of his words. His words are strong. His confession of faith, given to him by faith, by God, founded on this Christ standing right in front of him. All that he'd been taught, all that he'd seen comes to life right here and now. And Jesus recognizes that, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will never overcome it. Jesus does the building. Jesus is the builder. He's the actual stone, rejected, despised, causing many to fall, thrown down, causing his death, nailed to a cross, which takes all the little rocks and stones of the faithful, that's you and me, and builds us all up into the house of of God, the eternal kingdom built on the confession of who Jesus is and his church will be witnessing to Jesus' death no matter who people think he is. Peter's now a rock because of his words. Peter is what he says, and this is what we are. We are known by what we say, and Jesus is God's way of showing us how we can be strong and safe and secure in a world of restlessness and carelessness. God became one of us in Jesus, to be like one of us, to live like one of us, to give us a way of renewal from sin's harm today, now, and in heaven eternally when we die. And Jesus is here for us. Jesus died to show that in his perfect death, what harms us most is defeated. As he dies, so does sin and death and Satan. This important matter of faith comes against the backdrop of that cave, that facade with the numerous gods, and Jesus offers us not a quick fix, not many choices, not a detour, not a, not a way out, other than a cross and a path of serving and speaking and fighting against the threats of hell. Redemption of the world comes with the Messiah, the Son of the living God, laying down his life for your life and for the life of the world. Here too, Jesus also shows us what's possible now. Rather than let people wander life aimless, he instills a new and lasting identity, a way to tap into the heavenly kingdom through baptism, through scripture, through holy communion. Rather than make people guess, he gives certainty in who he is and how he comes to save all through his scriptures, through the witnesses of you and me. Jesus refused to be satisfied. He was not limited by the status quo and invites us to do the same. Because if Jesus' life and death show us how much God loves us, Jesus' resurrection shows us that love is more powerful than hate and fear and even death. He shows us, in short, that God wins. And we win. So we care about what people know about Jesus, too. That he loves, that he renews, that he feeds, he forgives, he tears down, he builds up, he makes all things new. And we can be bold in sharing who this Christ is. The church has the words, always has. And we have believers, we have the words. We have scriptural words. We live out the meaning of those words as we show the face of Jesus to the world with our songs, with our praying, with our simple teaching, our listening. We love God, we love neighbor. It's so simple. The Apostles' Creed, which we speak, outlines it very easily what and why we believe what we do. And that belongs to the church and to you, the body of Christ. And we are called out, gathered together in this place, 
and then going about our life through the week, proclaiming, helping, and the meaning behind the loosing, the binding Jesus mentions, that's part of the church's work too, by the Spirit's leading. And we participate in God's work of loosening others from the bonds of sin by bringing this message of hope and renewal and forgiveness and even better, to be reconcilers. Or we can simply let the world stay as it is. Let them be careless about what happens to them. Let them stay bound in their troubles. But that's not the way of Christ. So the work is before us. We are fueled by faith and what we believe, moved into the arena of the world with many backdrops in our lives that resemble Caesarea Philippi. But don't worry. Those gates of hell, they can't stop the push that we have against the grain. Hell's gates aren't that powerful. Jesus broke them open when he died and descended into hell. And remember, gates might look big and bad, but gates never attack. Gates aren't offensive weapons. No one ever won a battle by breaking open a gate. Gates are defensive by nature. Satan isn't going to hit you. He's limited by Jesus' cross and the resurrection. You will push on him and his gates and they won't last. So when Jesus talks about the church struggling with the forces of evil, Jesus inspires and animates you, his church, his stones upon the rock, to be offensive, not to be rude or cruel or be, become an offense or condescending or any of that. We have enough of that in the world and in the church, but we are a humble servant mentality. Let the confession from the rock like Peter be your words. Don't worry. Hell will be counting on their gate to be defensive. And when it does, that gate will not last. In Jesus, there is solid stability and security for us against all the onslaughts of darkness. In the pagan darkness of that strange place, Peter could see the light in the darkness. When it's most uncomfortable, we're able to see the comfort of Jesus. It's there. In that awkward little field trip, far away from what was known, that Jesus the Christ can be proclaimed and seen in you. And we're the ones now who go out into the darkness and boldly plant the standard of light, the victory of God, because the light always shines in the darkness. It will not prevail. We can't retreat. We can't hide away. We can't think all is lost. There's too many demons and false gods to battle. No, people's lives are at stake for their salvation, eternal lives. We know who Jesus is revealed to you, implanted into your heart by baptism, the church will not be overcome. In other words, it's going to be around until the end of time. And Jesus has a pretty good track record of keeping promises. When he says that, it happens. Jesus still builds his church. He still uses us to do it. He will build his church through you. He has given you the keys to the kingdom. We go out in faith, storming the gates of death and showing that Jesus is still the Christ, the Messiah. He will be in you. He will be with you. His teaching and grace flowing through you. You are strong. You are Jesus. He is your identity. He is your resume. Satan can't hurt you. His gates won't last. Amen. And now may the peace of God which goes beyond our human understanding guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us go forth in peace, comfort, hope, and confidence. Christ lives in you. Thanks be to God. Amen.